Hello lovelies, in this video the brilliant Dr. Redwoods is going to be going through the whole of AQA A-Level Body Topic 7. So that is populations and ecosystems. Now there is lots of information in here, lots of keywords, lots of things you need to pay attention to. So take this slowly, make notes as you're going along, pause the video, copy down any examples or definitions you want to copy down, and then once you've finished you can jump over to the website and see the rest of our vision resources. intelligence is something we will have looked at and done at GCSE. It's just now got a really fancy name. So remember that human cells are diploid, which means they have two copies of each chromosome. One comes from each parent. One chromosome comes from sperm, one comes from the egg. They're arranged in what we call homologous pairs, and that means that they'll have two versions of that gene, one on each chromosome. These are called alleles, so they are versions of a gene the location, which is fixed, so the fixed location of each allele on each chromosome is its locus. And so the alleles for each gene will be at the same locus on each chromosome. Remember, obviously, the reason we have this is that sperm and eggs, gametes, they are haploid. So they only have one allele for each gene and they don't have pairs of chromosomes. If we're thinking about alleles, remember, we give them letters often. So either lowercase a or uppercase a. Here's my pair of homologous chromosomes, bands or the stripes on these chromosomes, they represent the genes. So if we have two capital letter A's being a big A, then that means we are homozygous dominant. If we are two small A's, two lowercase A's, then that means we are homozygous recessive. So homozygous just means the same. So two, both alleles are the same, either two dominant alleles or two recessive alleles. If we have one of each, so a dominant and a recessive allele, a capital A and a little a, then we are heterozygous. Hetero meaning different. I remember dominant just means that you only need one of those alleles for it to be expressed. Whereas we only see the recessive phenotype if we have both lowercase letters or both uh, recessive alleles. Monohybrid inheritance then is the simplest version of inheritance because it involves kind of what we've been looking at here. So one characteristics which is controlled by one gene which has two alleles. Okay, so we've got a couple of monohybrid crosses that we can always rely on to give the similar predictable ratios. The first one is that if you have both parents are homozygous, so homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive, all offspring are then going to be heterozygous. All of the offspring are going to have the same genotype and therefore they're going to have the same phenotype. One of Mendel's examples of this was looking at specific traits in kind of peas. So peas are seeds and whether they were round or whether so round and smooth or whether they were kind of wrinkly and bumpy. So the round smooth phenotype is due to having homozygous dominant genotype and the wrinkled kind of bumpy phenotype is from having homozygous recessive. So if you put that into a simple Punnett square with the same ratio that we just talked about so all of the offspring are heterozygous they all have one dominant allele and one recessive allele and so therefore the F1 generation have 100% big R, little r as their genotype, so heterozygous genotype, and so they're all going to be round and smooth. So then if we take that generation, the F1, and we're going to cross them, two of those, we'll see what happens in the F2 generation because that gives us our second predictable ratio. So if both parents begin as heterozygous, so they have big R and little r in this case, there's always going to be a three to one ratio of phenotypes in the offspring. And that's because we're always going to get a one to one ratio of genotypes. We're going to get one homozygous dominant, we're going to get two heterozygous, and we're going to get one homozygous recessive. And again, you can use the Punnett square or genetic diagram to kind of prove this and show that this always works. So we have two round, smooth seeds, but they are both heterozygous in their genotype as parents. That means each of them could have a dominant allele or a recessive allele in their gametes, which means that depending on the mix of those, we will get one homozygous dominant, two potential heterozygous, and one potential homozygous recessive. So we get that F2 generation, three to one ratio, three round to one wrinkled. If we ask about probabilities, we can also say, obviously, there's 25% chance of getting wrinkled peas, there's a 75% chance of getting round smooth peas. You can be asked in the same way. And the idea that they are predictable, so we know that it's going to happen every single time we have these similar crosses. 
So I said that these ratios are expected, and that is true. And with some crosses, you will expect to see exactly that ratio in the offspring. It doesn't matter how many, if they had a um, hundred offspring, 25 of them would be wrinkled, and then 75% of them, 75 out of the hundred, would be round and smooth. But that's not always what we actually see in nature. So we don't always see those perfect ratios. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is obviously fertilization and the fusion of gametes is random. So we're not always necessarily going to have gametes that can be both of those potential alleles. Potential that all of the gametes produced from one have the same allele. There's another thing that called codominance that also affects these ratios. Sex linkage, where some genes are specifically inherited on certain chromosomes, the X and the Y chromosomes. You could be taking samples from small populations. So Mendel discovered these ratios because he was looking at really large populations. So he was able to grow hundreds of plants. And so he was able to get these ratios reliably. The other thing is crossing over and independent assortment in meiosis. The chromosomes lay on top of each other and where they lay on top of each other, they form what we call a chiasma. And part of that chromosome breaks off. It breaks at the chiasma and one part that was attached to one chromosome swaps. So then that means that whereas you would have potentially inherited a certain set of alleles, now you might get different ones because those physical alleles have swapped chromosomes. So they may end up in different gametes. And all of these are things we need to think about because you may get asked the question about why a ratio you've been given in an exam question isn't exact three to one ratio that we've looked at or some other predicted ratios we're gonna look at. Okay, so one of those examples I just gave was codominance. So alleles can be codominant if they're both expressed in a phenotype because neither one of them is recessive. So we can still have obviously two chromosomes and in our homologous pair, and we can still have two alleles. But instead of having one dominant and one recessive allele, both of these alleles act as if they are dominant. And so they can both appear in the phenotype, so you can get the characteristics of both genes, or you can produce what we call a blended phenotype, which will make sense when we go through this example. But there will be some where you can get a patchwork effect of different colours, for example, or different traits mixed together. Or you can end up with what we call a blended effect, so you pigments or whatever in this example it's going to be pigments come together and produce a blended sort of spectrum. Our example we're going to look at is flower colour, so the flower colour in the petals. So this is gene C, C for colour. It will either have white alleles or red alleles. We've got two capitals here and they code for different colours, in this case white or red. If I have what we call a true breeding, cross to start with, they are both obviously homozygous. So they are having, showing that they've got these, both of these dominant alleles and that comes out as that colour in the petals. Now we do exactly the same things we normally do with the Punnett square, the capital C's here, and then we kind of do the same as we normally would with the letters on the top. So I've got CRCW, 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 but we've got 100% pink offspring because both are dominant and by having both the red and the white alleles, they mix together the pigments to form a pink phenotype. It could be that you could have flowers that have blotches of, of red and white. In this case, we're going for a blended example, so we get pink. So although obviously this is an expected ratio, it's not the phenotype ratio we'd expect because they're dif it's different from their parents. So let's do the second cross that we looked at. So let's do a heterozygous cross with two pink flowers this time, but this time they are heterozygous, so they are both CRCW. So this time the gametes is they could either give an R or they can give a W. So we're going to have, this would be our three to one expected ratio of phenotypes, but is it going to be that? Let's see. So we're going to have CRCR, which is obviously going to be red. We're going to have CRCW, which is going to be pink. We're going to have CRCW, which is also going to be pink. And then we're going to have CWCW, which is going to be white. So we have a one to two to one ratio of phenotypes, not our expected three to one. Because of the codominance, we have some red, we have some white, and we have some blended pink as well. So this is where codominance can slightly change that expected phenotype, but in the way we write it and the way we work this out is exactly the same as how we've done the previous cross. You just have to have those letters as superscript on your capitals. Inheritance can affect the expected ratios, and it could be that the alleles are codominant instead of being, following the usual rule of being either recessive or dominant. Okay, so multiple alleles occur when a gene has more than two alleles, so they can have three or more. Within these three alleles, there'll be more than one allele that's dominant, or there could be more than one allele that's recessive, for example. 
So looking for a blood type then, the immunoglobulin G, which we're gonna have as I here, codes for the antigens on the surface of red blood cells. So it determines your blood type. There's three alleles, A, B, and O. A and B are both dominant, and so they'll be co-dominant if they're present together. And then O is recessive to both A and B. So if it's there, A or B will always be the antigen type that is present on the blood cells. And if you get two O's, then you basically don't have any antigens on your red blood cells. They still can follow a certain expected ratio. Three to one ratio would occur if both parents have the same blood type. So for this example, we're looking at two parents that both have blood type B, but they are carriers of the O allele. So this would be when we have heterozygous parents in a normal ratio, for example. So we get two children with B, O, same phenotype as the parents, one with double B, and then one with double O. So we get three to one ratio because three of those children will have B blood type and one will have O blood type. Because this is the double homozygous recessive, it's rarer. And so those O blood type people are, are rare in the population, but they are the ones that obviously are the best people to donate blood. The other predicted ratio we can get is if we have um, two parents who are different blood types and again are carriers of the O allele. So we have an A blood type and a B blood type. So that means we'll get an AB combination and they're both dominant. So that means that blood group is AB. We will have an A and we will have an, a B blood type child. And then we'll also get that um, double recessive O as well. So we literally have four different blood type outcomes from two parents. So the ratio is one to one to one to one. Die, obviously here meaning two. So this is when we're looking at two characteristics that are inherited from two different genes which have different alleles. So these can show the probability of inheriting certain combinations. So two different genes and each of them has their own alleles. So in this case, P shape codes for either smooth P's or wrinkled peas. And in this case, my homologous pair, I've got both alleles. For pea colour, I can either have green peas or I can have yellow peas. This is one of those sets of traits that Mendel used to be able to figure out how this type of inheritance worked. For this individual that I've got here with my example, their genotype is heterozygous for both. So they have a dominant and recessive for both genes. And because we're looking at two genes, both with two alleles, we have four letters. That's our diploid genotype. So the phenotype for this will be smooth green peas, because smooth and green are both the dominant traits. If I were to take two of these smooth green pea producing plants with this heterozygous genotype and cross them, what gametes could this individual produce? So normally we'd have two alleles for one gene, and then when we had our gametes, we would have one allele of each. So they could have either big R or small R, or either big G or little g. But because we're looking at two genes, the gametes are gonna be two letters. So because we have four possible combinations of gametes, our Punnett square will need to be double the size. So there are expected ratios for this type of cross as well. So in dihybrid crosses, when the heterozygous parents are crossed, there's four possible gametes, as we just saw. So there's 16 possible offspring genotypes, and there is an expected ratio, in this case, of nine to three to three to one. So often you'll be introduced to this idea by talking about how do we actually get the first generation, homozygous dominant and homozygous recessive. So the phenotypes that you get are from entirely um, homozygous genotypes. So we don't have any heterozygous mixing in there, we just have all capital letters and all small letters. To get F2, we're going to cross two heterozygous individuals and we're gonna need this big, slightly larger Punnett square. So let's have a look at what we're gonna get. So remember, anything that has a capital R is gonna be smooth and anything that has at least one capital G is going to be yellow. So the easiest thing to do is to put the smooth yellow in first, so everything with at least one capital R gets and one capital G gets a yellow dot. Now everything that has a capital R, at least a capital R but lowercase g, is going to be smooth and green. So do those next. So I'm looking for lowercase g's but with at least one uppercase R will be smooth and green. So I have three round and green and obviously this is starting to look like we figure out that it's going to be our expected three to nine to three to three to one ratio so anything with lowercase r's is going to be wrinkled but if they've got at least a capital g they will be yellow 
So there's one, two, and three. So they've all got lowercase r's, at least one capital G, so they are yellow but wrinkly. And then last of all, we have our homozygous recessive for both genes is going to give us our wrinkled and green seed. Again, this has given us our expected ratio 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, but this ratio doesn't always actually occur in nature. You're not always going to see this in the outcomes of breeding various plants together. And this can be due to two things. We had the list before, but the other thing that can influence where you're looking at two characteristics inherited together are things like epistasis and linkage. Some genes can interact to control the same characteristic, so it's not always one gene, one characteristic. But in this case, the genes aren't coding for separate things, separate characteristics, they're coding for the same characteristic. And when they actually interact with each other, or they mask or suppress the other gene's expression, that's what we call epistasis. So two genes at different locuses, changing the expression of each other. There's a couple of different examples, often including pigments, visible phenotypes, so colours, pigments, something that can be changed by an enzyme as well. So if there's kind of an enzyme substrate chain that can also be controlled by epistasis and in this case it's the genes are coding for enzymes that will change colors or pigments and that's how this interaction comes about so let's look at an example of flower color so we have two genes gene one is codes codes for pigment so whether or not you can make a yellow pigment so if you have two copies of the recessive allele you will not make any pigment you'll be white. If you're a flower or plant that has at least one dominant allele for gene one, then you will be able to make this yellow pigment. Then we have gene two. Gene two doesn't code for a pigment. Gene two codes for an enzyme, which will react with the yellow pigment and turn it orange. So if you have two recessive alleles, so little r's in this case, for gene two, no enzyme is going to be made. So it will either stay yellow or white, depending on what Add, um, alleles you have for gene one. If you have uh, the dominant allele, at least one dominant allele for gene two, then you can make the enzyme and that will react with the yellow pigment if it's there and create an orange flower. Now obviously gene two is reliant on gene one to a certain extent because if you are able to make the enzyme with gene two but you don't have any yellow pigment because you can't make it because of the alleles you have for gene one then there will be no substrate for that enzyme so no orange pigment will be made so if there's no yellow pigment there can't be any orange pigment and so that's where we get kind of a masking of the expression of gene two because depending on gene one you wouldn't be able to tell whether a plant has gene two what alleles a plant has for gene two if you don't make any pigment with gene one. So this is why we can have these different outcomes. So if gene one has at least one dominant allele, then the flower will be yellow. If they then also have one, at least one dominant allele for gene two, they'll be able to make the enzyme so they will be orange because it'll be able to turn that yellow pigment into an orange pigment. However, if gene one is homozygous recessive, so two little y's, no pigment will be made. So it doesn't matter what gene two alleles a plant has, there's no pigment to act as the enzyme substrate, so then the flower will be white or colourless. So these are kind of the options we have, but the idea here is we're getting this idea of an interaction where gene two doesn't matter what alleles you have, it can be masked, so you, you wouldn't know what alleles they have because their phenotype would not exist if gene one is homozygous recessive. So we describe this as gene one being epistatic to gene two because it can mask the expression of gene two. So these are our options for the genotypes and phenotypes, two genes with different alleles and we get three phenotypes. Again, this is an example of where you're gonna get different phenotypic outcomes, different ratios than those expected nine to three to three to one ratios that we'd expect if we were crossing two, two genes. So epistasis can be either recessive or dominant. Each is gonna give us a different ratio other than that expected nine to three to three to one ratio. For recessive epistasis, it's very similar to the um, example we just looked at with the flower colour. So it's when two recessive alleles at the first gene mask the expression at the second gene. So for a heterozygous F1 cross, we're going to get a 9 to 3 to 4 ratio. So we're going to look at fur colour in mice. So in this case, 
for gene two, we are going to be looking at the alleles A and AA. And so if you have at least one dominant allele, you'll have brown fur. If you have two recessive alleles for gene two, so two little A's, you're going to be black and have black fur. For gene one, we're going to use the letters B, so big B or little b. So for gene one, if you are homozygous recessive, so two small b's, you will have no pigment, you will be albino. So here we have, again, recessive epistasis, so gene one is epistatic to gene two, because if we don't have at least one dominant allele for gene one, so if we don't have a big B or um, two big Bs, then we are going to not be able to make any pigment at all. So it doesn't matter what is then at gene two, it doesn't matter whether we are gonna have brown alleles or black alleles, we will not have any pigment, we will just be white. Okay, so it works in a similar way. So let's have a look at how we can get our gametes. So we're gonna do a heterozygous cross. And so remember, this is recessive epistasis. So gene one is masking the expression of gene two if there is no dominant allele for gene one or if there's two homozygous alleles for gene one. Anything that has a capital A, at least one capital A, and at least one capital B is going to be brown because if they have at least one capital B, that means they can make pigment. If they have at least one capital A, that means that pigment will be brown pigment. And there's all our browns. For black fur, we're going to be looking for anyone that has at least one capital B, but that doesn't have a capital A. So then we will get black fur, which means they can make the pigment because they have at least one dominant for gene one for Bs, but they are recessive gene two, so they are going to have black fur. And then all of the others then that are left will be white because they will not have a dominant allele for gene one, so they won't have any capital Bs. So therefore it doesn't matter what alleles they have for the gene A or gene two, they will be white because they cannot make any pigment. So that shows us that we get that nine to three to four ratio. So there's nine brown, there's four white, and there's three black. Okay, so let's have a look at dominant epistasis then. So this is different because this is when you have at least one dominant allele at gene one, then we're going to mask the expression of gene two. So we're gonna get a 12 to three to one ratio this time if we do a heterozygous F1 cross. So the example we're gonna look at is fruit color in squash. The color of the squash, yellow or green, is controlled by gene two in this example. So we're either gonna have again, if we have a dominant, at least one dominant allele will be yellow, if we have homozygous recessive for gene two, we will have green squash. We will have white or no color if we have at least one dominant allele for gene one. So at gene one, if we have at least one dominant allele, we will not be able to make any pigment. We will have white or no color. So in order to get yellow or green squash, we need to have homozygous recessive for gene one. So we're only going to have Colour if we have little b, little b for gene one. So gene one masks gene two if there is a dominant, at least one dominant allele at gene one. So we're going to cross two white squash that are heterozygous. So they are big A, little a, big B, little b. Majority of these will be white because we're looking for anything that has two little b's and a dominant letter A will be yellow. And the only way we can be green is if we can be homozygous recessive completely for both genes. So homozygous at B will then give us a colour and then we have to be homozygous at A in order to be green. So there's only three yellow and one green and the rest of the 12 are all white. And so this is how you can see the ratio is different. So we get a 12 to three to one ratio. And this time we actually get sort of quite a majority of that kind of pale no colour because of that masking being caused by dominant genes rather than recessive genes. Sex-linked genes are genes for specific characteristics that are found only on the sex chromosomes. So that's going to throw up some specific patterns. And these are kind of the common patterns to look out for that are normally are kind of explanations for why certain genes are going to be inherited in a certain way if they are sex-linked. So most sex-linked genes are found on the X chromosome, and so we refer to them as X-linked genes. And this is because the Y chromosome is smaller, it's about half the size, so it carries fewer genes. So Y-linked genes, specific Y-linked genes that we know about, are quite rare. So males will only ever be able to have one allele of each sex-linked gene, 
because they only have one of each chromosome, they don't have a pair. And so they will always express the characteristics of that gene, even if it's recessive. So it doesn't matter what alleles they have on the X and Y chromosomes, they will express them because they aren't a pair. So they won't carry the same genes. They won't have two copies. They won't have a dominant and a recessive. They will just have one recessive copy if they have it or one dominant copy if they have it. So this means they're more likely to have recessive phenotypes because they can't be carriers of X-linked genes. And so they're more likely to have any recessive phenotypes that are caused by recessive genes on the X chromosome. Females on the opposite side then, so literally the opposite to that, they get two copies of every X-linked gene. So they're less likely to have recessive phenotypes because they are able to have dominant genes and be heterozygous. And so it's for them, in order to have recessive disorders of genes that are on the X chromosome, they would need to have the two recessive copies. They obviously can then also be carriers of X-linked recessive genes. So they can be able to pass those on to their offspring, but not have the disorder. Whereas males will be able to pass on those genes to offspring, but they will always have the disorder. They can't be a carrier. In males, all Y chromosomes are inherited from sperm, obviously, and all X chromosomes are inherited from X. X-linked genes, including disorders, will be passed on from mother to son. So that's why normally um, we see these disorders being linked and sort of displaying in males, but they come or have been donated to them from their mothers. Autosome sounds like a fancy word, but it basically just means non-sex chromosomes. So the other 22 pairs of chromosomes in humans are all autosomes because they are not sex chromosomes. So most genes that are on separate or different chromosomes are assorted independently. So the allele received for one gene doesn't affect whether you get the allele for the other gene or not. This gives us the typical 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 or 9 to 3 to 3 to, to 1 ratios that we'd expect for dihybrid crosses between different genotypes of parents. I've got my chromosomes here. I've got two different chromosomes and they're not a homologous pair. Uh, and on this chromosome we have gene 1 and it's not linked to the other genes. So it's not going to determine if you get gene one, it's not going to have any effect on whether you get gene two, gene three, or gene four, because they're on completely different chromosomes. However, gene two, gene three, and gene four are all on the same chromosome. So we say that these genes are linked because they are close together on the same chromosome. So they are very likely to be inherited together. So having gene two, means you'll have gene three and gene four. Like all of those genes are coming together as a package because they're very close to each other. They're obviously, and they're on the same chromosome. They're gonna to stay to each, together during independent assortment. They will likely then enter the gamete together. Only crossing over would be able to separate them because that's the only way genes would be separated from the same chromosome and put onto another chromosome. Now this produces an unexpected ratio because there's more gametes which contain the linked genes and fewer where we get a random combination of them or recombinant where they've been swapped over. Now, if we look at a similar example with linked genes, and I've just halved the number of chromosomes here to make it slightly easier to see. So I've got two chromosomes, but they have linked alleles and linked genes this time. So I've got capital A and capital B on one chromosome, little a, little b on one chromosome. It's more likely little a and little b will travel together on that same chromosome into one gamete, and the capital A and capital B will travel on one chromosome to a, to a gamete. It's much less likely for crossing over to happen and to have split those two up so we get a different combination where we would get a big A and a little b and a big B and a little a together. It can happen and it can happen through crossing over but it's just much less likely. So instead of the nice 25% chance of each of those being inherited because they're on different chromosomes, because they're on the same chromosome, we're more likely to inherit the same chromosome structure with the same genes as parents because they will stay on that same chromosome and just move into a gamete when they get separated than crossing over to happen and for us to get a different combination or what we call a recombinant chromosome. So if we look at the actual percentages of what we actually get, we've got 48% chance or nearly 48% chance of getting the A and B capital letters and the little a and the little b small letters because they're more likely to stay together and therefore more likely to end in the gamete together because they're on the same chromosome. There's only 2% chance that we will get 
a recombinant chromosome in our gamete because it relies on crossing over to happen. Okay, so we're going to look at the Hardy-Weinberg equation, which is sometimes um, just under the category of population genetics. So we're just basically going to use some algebra and some maths and some rules to be able to actually work out how many or the proportion of a gene or a phenotype or a genotype or an allele in the population. So let's have a look at some key terms that we're going to need for this. So when we say a population, we mean a group of organisms that is of the same species and they occupy a particular space at a particular time, so they're in a specific habitat, and at that point in time, they can interbreed with each other. A gene pool, you might have heard this term before, but in this case, what we're talking about is basically just the total number of alleles that are present in that population. So the genes and alleles that can be chosen and passed on between organisms in this population. And then the allelic frequency is the proportion or the percentage of a certain allele in the gene pool relative to the others. Okay, so let's look at the presentation of those. So I have a population. In my population, I have some red flowers and I have some white flowers. They're the same species. They can interbreed with each other in this field that we're in. The red flowers are coded for by the dominant allele A and the white flowers are coded for by the recessive allele A, little a. The gene pool is all of the mixing that's going on. So it's the total number of alleles that are present in that population at that time. I've made it small so we can uh, get our heads around it. So I've got six red capital A alleles and I have four white lowercase a alleles in my gene pool. The frequency of red allele A is 0.6 or 60% and then my frequency of little a or my white flower allele is 0.4 or 40%. It has to add up to one because we've only got these two alleles here that we're looking at. This also gives us an indication of what the proportion is or the percentage chance or the probability of these alleles appearing in the gametes. So for each gamete, there'll be a 40% chance of there being a lowercase a letter in that gamete and a 60% chance of there being a dominant letter a in that gamete. And so that's when we do a Punnett square and then we would probably find out that that was the chance of that happening. So this is like a little example of a population where we've got breeding happening, we've got these frequencies and in this population here, we can see we've got a 60% chance of the dominant allele and a 40% chance of the recessive allele being present in the genotype. The Hardy-Weinberg principle states that this allelic frequency, so this 60% for red dominant, 40% for white recessive, will be maintained from one generation to the next. It won't, it won't um, be different. So the 60% and the 40% should stay like that, generation on generation on generation. This can be used to determine if change is occurring in a population. So if we've got a kind of null hypothesis, a sort of blanket statement that it shouldn't be changing from one generation to the next, then if it is changing from one generation to the, to the next, then it's not fitting within those rules of the Heine weinberg principle, which means something is causing frequency of alleles to change. Evolution's definition is change in frequency of alleles over time. If you think about when we describe like natural selection, what that does is it increases a certain allele frequency in a population and decreases a certain allele frequency in the population because the allele frequency that increases is the one that denotes an advantage to that species and allows it to survive and reproduce and therefore more of that allele is passed on. So you can see how if we can see a change in frequencies of um, alleles over time in a population, that can demonstrate that evolution or change is happening. The reason this is like our baseline, our null hypothesis, is because for hardy weinberg to be true, for there to be no change in allele frequency generation on generation, some of these facts or some of these assumptions must be true. So there must be no mutation occurring. That means no new alleles are ever being created and we stick with the ones that we have and they're the same. No migration of organisms into or out of the population, so no new organisms come into this population and start breeding and they introduce new forms of alleles. And no alleles leave with certain individuals and move away from the population and go and form a different population. That the population we're looking at is sufficiently large, so that the ratios and the percentages and the frequencies that we're looking at are representative. That there's no selection occurring, so all alleles have an equal chance of being inherited in every generation. So like I just said, if natural selection was occurring and uh, organisms with certain alleles were, were not surviving and not reproducing because they were dying or they were being um, caught more easily by predators or whatever, then their alleles are less likely to be inherited by the next generation and the ones with the stronger alleles are more likely to be inherited. So that can't be happening. There must be no selection occurring. Every allele should be equally available 
to every breeding pair every single time. Mating is random, so every genotype in the population can breed with everyone else, and there isn't any sort of sexual selection, and no one's going, no um, females are specifically picking certain males or anything like that. Obviously, this doesn't exist in real life, because some or all of these forces act on living populations at various times, and on some level, evolution is occurring in all living organisms in all populations, because natural selection is a fact of life. The Hardy-Weinberg formula allows us to detect changing allele frequencies between generations, see how much it's changing, and therefore allow the simplified method of being able to show that allele frequencies are changing and therefore evolution is happening or changing over time. And it might not be evolution, it might be other things that you were looking at. So you might be that the reason that it doesn't fit hardy weinberg is that you were looking at a really small population room. So anything like this is a way of taking hardy weinberg and showing that change is happening in the allele frequencies of a population. And then you can use one of these reasons or there'll be background information that you can use to explain why that change is happening. But in order to show that change has happened, you need to calculate hardy weinberg for some allele frequencies at a certain time and then hardy weinberg for a certain allele frequency after a certain time has happened to compare them. So something from the 1970s and now, be able to show that there's a difference between those allele frequencies using the equations. First equation we need to know is P plus Q equals one. P is the frequency of the dominant allele in the population, in this case, capital A, if we're using our flowers. Q is the frequency of the recessive allele in the population, in this case, little a. So we looked at the, the frequencies on the last slide. So red A, capital A allele, the dominant allele was 0.6, and little a was 0.4. This makes sense because that means P is 0.6 and Q is 0.4. P plus Q must equal one. You can see how then if you're only given one of these, either P or Q, you can easily find the other one by doing one minus. This also helps us to understand the second equation. Slightly longer, slightly more complicated, but similar in terms of what we're showing. So this is now looking at not the alleles themselves, but the genotypes. So we've got P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. So P was the dominant allele, so P squared is the homozygous dominant genotype in the population, that's its frequency, so capital A, capital A. 2PQ is the frequency of the heterozygous genotype, so big A, little a, and then Q squared is the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype, two small a's. And they all also have to add up to one. And this makes sense. So if I do a little Punnett square, if we replace the letters big A, little a, with their letters here, P and Q, the algebra makes sense if you think what the letters are representing, and then the maths makes sense once you've got those numbers just representing those letters. So that's genotypes, or allele frequencies. The last thing we have to think about is phenotypes. So be careful here. So red flower phenotypes would be coded for by both homozygous dominant, capital A's, and the heterozygous genotype. So we need to add together those proportions for those two genotypes in order to find out what percentage of the population would have the red flower phenotype. And then obviously what's left over, so the 16%, the, the homozygous recessive, that would be the only one that would give a white phenotype. So we would get 84% of the population would have, be expected to have red flowers and 16% of the population would be expected to have white flowers. Natural selection is obviously a process that will change allele frequencies and it is a process that obviously drives evolution, but it relies on there being variation in a population to start with. So variation is the differences that exist between individuals in a population, and most variation is due to individuals having different combinations of alleles, which produces the different phenotypes. But variation can be caused by both environmental and genetic causes, and most likely it is always a combination of both. So let's just remind ourselves what are the causes of both types of variation. For humans, lifestyle plays a big factor in environmental variation. So your food habits, where you live, the levels of pollution you're exposed to, how much exercise you get. For animals, it's things like our abiotic factors and biotic factors. So availability of food or water. For plants, it's availability of light, nutrients, water as well, and like light intensity. Other factors that can impact everything, climatic changes. So genetic factors then, the main one is obviously mutation. So a change to the DNA sequence, so the, the sequence of bases in DNA, or a change to the number of chromosomes, for example. And um, all of these count as mutations and they can lead to genetic variation. 
there's a link there obviously with the idea of environmental cause potentially exposure to a mutagen or a carcinogenic compound or UV radiation for example can then lead to mutation and then they can cause um, genetic variation. During meiosis we create genetic variation through independent assortment and crossing over and then finally, fertilisation of gametes is random. So we do not know which sperm and which egg are going to meet and fuse. So the new parental combinations of genes that are going to be made from the random fusion of two gametes is completely due to chance. And so that new combination of parental genes is random every single time. OK, so natural selection is one of the processes that drives evolution. The other is genetic drift. In a population, not all organisms are able to survive and therefore they will not be able to reproduce. Some individuals die um, or they fail to produce due to predation, disease or competition for resources. So food, water, space, mates, light, whichever type of organism they are. And these are all known as selection pressures. So this idea of a change in the environment or predators, disease, competition, these biotic factors or abiotic factors causing animals to struggle to survive and reproduce are all pressures which then drive natural selection to occur. If selection pressures are different for different populations of the same species, then they will be slowly pushed apart and move away from each other in terms of their allele frequencies will become different over time, especially if they cannot interbreed with each other and then we get evolution occurring and eventually speciation. The example is obviously the moths, where we have dark moths and light moths in the population. And when the environmental factor changed, so the industrial revolution happened and made this kind of dark, sooty colour on the outside of trees. So we had this kind of uh, soot layer on the outside of the trees that happened due to the amount of pollution and smog when all the factories sprung up. So that was a change in the environment. And that was then a selection pressure because the darker moths were better camouflaged against birds. And so they were harder to see on the trees. And so they were less likely to be predated upon. This means that more black or darker patterned moths were able to survive and reproduce and pass on their alleles for that dark colouring. What's interesting is that this actually then was able to be shown to be reversed. So once the Clean Air Act came in, the smoke and the smog prevented due to various um, techniques and we reduced that colouring. So it moved back towards a more lighter colour on the trees. And so that was no longer a selection pressure. Being really dark was no longer favourable. It actually shifted back to being more light coloured being the advantage. So the variation of population can be shown as a bell curve as the frequency of phenotypes. So obviously we have the mean, which is the middle, the hump in the middle where there's the most of a certain phenotype because that is the average. And then towards the edges of that, we have slightly fewer of each phenotype that are what we would call the extremes. Natural selection is gonna promote or eliminate certain genotypes and therefore phenotypes. So the bell curve is gonna shift or change depending on the type of natural selection that's happening. So stabilizing selection where individuals with the phenotypes that's closest to the mean they're more likely to survive and reproduce. And so the mean stays the same after selection has happened over time, but the range of phenotypes or genotypes is just reduced. So it occurs when the environment isn't changing, there's no kind of massive change to their surroundings, but it's about something to do with survival normally. So for example, birth weight um, or mean number of eggs laid by robins. So we see that narrowing of the bell curve into the middle and we get that kind of really tall peak around the mean but a very less wide curve. Directional selection is when it moves, this sort of whole curve shifts to the left or to the right, and the mean actually moves in a direction away from the original. And this is normally when, instead of favoring the mean, the middle, the middle ground, one of the two extreme phenotypes on the ends of that bell curve is favored or selected for. So it's more likely to survive and reproduce. It occurs in response to an environmental change. So the environment produced this bell curve and we've got this range of phenotypes and suddenly there is a change in the environment and one of those extremes is favoured. The moths and the trees. You could also use antibiotic resistance as an example. And then lastly we have disruptive which is slightly rarer but it's where individuals with alleles for the extreme phenotypes are more likely to reproduce but sometimes this is more than one. So the mean in the middle, the one that is kind of the average, the one that was the highest in the frequency in the original environment is no longer what's favored. And it incurs normally with a fluctuating environment, which favors more than one phenotype. 
So this is a hypothetical example, but there could be, it could have been a snowy landscape on a mountain. And so the white rabbits were more favoured because they were better camouflaged. A big melting of the ice caps and now there is no more snow or it's more, more of the year now is spent not in snow. And so the kind of two other variations that exist in the population, the black rabbits and the grey rabbits, they're better camouflaged against the rocks now and the white rabbits are more likely to be picked off by predators. So then we get this splitting and a diversifying of the selection where we get two different phenotypes or genotypes increasing in frequency and we get one of them decreasing. So there's two types of speciation and obviously both can create new species. They both involve the processes of natural selection and then we've also got genetic drift which is another way that we can drive change in allele frequencies, evolution and ultimately speciation but without that idea of natural selection and the pushing or driving of the selection pressure to change populations. Allopatric speciation relies on geographical isolation, so physical separation of half of each population or a portion of the population from each other, so they physically cannot get to each other. They have been separated, split off of islands, separated by a mountain range, separated by a really large river that they can't cross, so they physically can't get to each other in order to breed. That's how they become reproductively isolated. Different environmental conditions can then occur in the two new areas where they are separated. One of them may stay the same as it was before, but the other environment that they've been isolated into could be an island and with a different environment and different abiotic conditions. So because they have different environments, they're going to be under pressure from different selection pressures. The environment might be different, the food source might be different, the temperature or climate might be different, the predators might be different, there might be a new disease. So think about our biotic and the biotic factors that could be different in this new environment. These will be the selection pressures that then different mutations will occur. So there'll be, there'll be variation in that populations anyway, but mutations will occur as well. And then we'll have advantageous alleles that are different. So in the different environments, different things, different alleles, different characteristics are going to be more beneficial because the conditions are different. These will, different alleles will allow organisms to survive and reproduce and they'll pass those on to their offspring. So over time we're going to change the allele frequency in both populations and that means eventually that phenotype frequencies will change and the populations will become so different from each other that they'll become reproductively isolated from each other. So even if they mixed back in, even if the barrier was disappeared or moved or they were able to mix back together as one population at some point, they would be so different that they wouldn't be able to breed with each other and so therefore they become separate species. And therefore we've got two new species, so speciation has happened. So our second type of speciation is Sympatric speciation. So this is where random mutations or change in behaviour prevents individuals from breeding with others that do not have the same mutational behaviour within a population. So there's no physical or geographical separation here that causes them to not be able to breed with each other. It's something to do with behaviour or a mutation or them not being able to recognise each other as the same species, for example, for some reason. That means that they won't breed with each other. So sort of two groups within a population separate somehow. A small group goes off for some reason. And then because they're no longer into breeding and you have this kind of isolated population within the whole group, so actually they're not physically isolated in space, they could breed with each other, but for some reason they're not able to. Over time, obviously, the two groups will change in allele frequency just because you've got a small gene pool with this one group and you've got a separate gene pool with this one group. And again, different mutations will occur. The small group that started this this new group, they'll only be able to pass on the alleles they have and they'll pass on their behaviours and their courtship behaviour or whatever it is that they've got that's different. And so over time, the populations can become separate from each other. It's rarer for this to happen um, because obviously it, it takes sort of random circumstance or, or a really specific thing to happen, a mutation or something to occur that causes this kind of breakaway group within the same space as everybody else. So eventually, obviously, the phenotype frequencies will change and the populations become reproductively isolated from each other completely. And therefore, we've got speciation. So the example we use is of this apple maggot fly. And it's kind of one of the examples of sort of random chance, but also differences in behaviour. So the original population of apple maggot fly lay their eggs on hawthorn fruit. This fly reproduces is once those eggs have hatched and they fly away, when it's their time to mate and reproduce, they will return to the fruit on trees 
that are the same as the fruit that they were hatched from. So it's kind of like a known place to make sure you go back to where you hatched from. Everyone does it. They find a mate on the fruit, they mate, and then they lay eggs in that fruit. In the early 1900s, the apple was introduced to America, and the apple is a very close kind of evolutionary relative of the hawthorn, and obviously their fruit looks kind of similar. Some small group of flies in this population started laying their eggs in apple trees. Because of the way it works, where obviously you only go back to mate and lay your eggs in the same fruit as where you hatched, the ones that started laying their eggs in apple trees set this new precedent. So they will only go back to those apples and they will only be able to mate with flies that are also going back to those apples and they'll lay their eggs in apples and then the cycle continues. So at no point would the flies that laid their eggs in apples or the flies that hatch from apples ever go back to mating with the flies that hatched out of the hawthorn. So nothing has actually stopped these flies from mating with each other. They're still in the same environment. They're still kind of flying around and they could still technically go over and, and meet each other and mate and reproduce. Their gene pores aren't, they're not physically separated in any way. It's just that behaviourally they have isolated themselves as two separate groups because they're not going to mix, they're not going to mate with each other because a fly that hatched from an apple would never go back to a hawthorn to try and find a mate. The main thing here is to recognise, be able to recognise which one's which and be able to describe what happens in each. So genetic drift is another way that allele frequencies can be changed. And this is where we can change the frequency of alleles and ultimately lead to evolution and speciation, but it's not influenced by environmental factors. So we don't have selection pressures, which determine the survival and reproduction of organisms, and they, it doesn't determine which alleles get passed on based on natural selection. The alleles that get passed on are due to random chance. Okay, so it's often due to only some of the generation, some of each generation in a population reproducing. It's due, yeah, it's due to kind of a chance factor as opposed to this allele is more successful in this environment, so therefore these will survive and reproduce where the others will die. And so that's why more of that allele gets passed on. It's not about that, it's just about the fact that a chance event causes a certain, more of a certain allele to be passed on than others. So the mechanism is that we have variation in the population, same as always, same as the start of natural selection and anything else. And then by chance, an allele for one genotype is passed on to more offspring than the others. So the number of individuals with that allele increases in frequency in the population. Now this is most likely due to either a bottleneck or a founder effect, which we'll look at in a second, which is very similar to what we've said about so far with speciation. So obviously, Speciation can be caused by natural selection and different selection pressures if we talk about geographical isolation, for example. If by chance the same allele is passed on more often over repeated generations, so it doesn't just happen once, normally it's about repeated generations of this happening, then it can lead to evolution because we're going to change the allele frequency. You can see this more in small populations because if you have a small population to start with, if you split that population sum up, up somehow or you some chance event happens, it's more likely to have an influence on the gene pool because you've probably not got very many genes to start with. So in this example, this is the idea of a bottleneck effect that we call it. So we have a big population. And in this case, there's more blue alleles than there are purple alleles. Random chance causes a massive decrease in the population or a small amount of that population to be isolated. Then we have a really small population left of surviving individuals, and so the gene pool is massively decreased. If they're left to reproduce over time, it's likely that because there's a smaller number of alleles to choose from in that gene pool, the allele frequencies will have changed. So you can see in our next couple of generations, after a few generations, we now have way more of the purple allele than the blue, just because by chance there were more purple alleles in the gene pool for the new smaller population. A niche is the role of a species within its ecosystem or within its community. They can be biotic, so what it eats or what it is prey for, that could be its role, a biotic role. It could be an abiotic role, so it could be the temperature range that an organism lives in or the time of day it's active in, that's its niche in the ecosystem or community that it lives in. Niches can be separated by time, so different organisms can have different niches based on either time, location or behaviour. So two organisms, for example, may live in the same tree, but they might eat different food, so that's behaviour. Or they have different hunting styles, again, behaviour. It may be that although they live and occupy the same physical space, they could be separated about 
when they eat, even if they eat the same food. If you don't separate your niche from other organisms, you will overlap. And if you overlap your niche, you're going to share resources with other organisms in that same environment, in that same niche, and you're going to have to compete with them for those resources. If two species occupy the same niche, the more successful species, so the one that's able to survive and reproduce more and therefore produce more offspring, is going to eventually outcompete the other species, unless the other species can adapt somehow, so change its behaviour, change its location, change the time eats or whatever, in order to change their niche. If two organisms are occupying the same niche and they're directly competing for resources, one will eventually outcompete the other one. So adaptations can be for biotic or abiotic conditions. The abiotic and biotic lists of conditions or factors don't change really. So you just have to think about an adaptation for all the factors that you already know are abiotic. So water, obviously webbed feet, being able to swim, hold breath, go underwater. Temperature, so anything that's going to insulate them, keep them warm, reduce heat loss, enable them to hibernate. That's a physiological adaptation because um, they can hibernate by shutting down body systems over winter. Light intensity, so mostly plants um, this, but also some organisms are able to produce kind of UV protectant kind of sunscreen. Hippos is an example of that um, to protect them from UV damage and therefore radiation could which could obviously cause mutation or if you're in a plant it can obviously um, mess with your photosynthesis. Soil conditions so anything that could adapt them to low nutrient soils like carnivorous plants adapted to salt high salt soils or alkaline or, or acidic soils anything like that is going to be an adaptation to kind of your nutrient availability and also your soil conditions. Biotic adaptations then anything that increases your food sources, so access to a food source that others can't get. So I'm thinking about uses of tools or a behaviour, specific behaviour that allows you to maybe learn to smash a shell on a rock, but then other animals can't do that. So then you get the nutritious food and you're not competing with anyone for that food source. Finding and attracting mates sounds like a sort of difficult one, but again, remember that biotic conditions also mean being able to interact with other animals around you and specifically competing for things like mates that is a competition factor between members of the same species so anything that allows you to make sure that you're going to succeed or more likely to succeed um, or you're making sure that you're definitely going to mate with the right and correct species so that means that you'll have successful mating actively stopping competition with other um, organisms by harming them in some way um, so bacteria can produce antibiotics that will kill other bacteria around them but not themselves that helps to reduce competition. Plants, um, the creosote bush is an example of this, it can secrete toxins from their roots and that can damage the soil around them for other plants to grow so they're not going to be able to grow nearby. Population size is the total number of organisms of one species in one habitat. We need to know this new term which is carrying capacity, sometimes represented by the letter K, a lowercase letter K, which is the maximum stable population size of a species that an ecosystem can support. So for each species or, for, or collectively the species in the community within this ecosystem, what is the maximum that that can get to that can be supported by that ecosystem? And so they think about it, that's all of the ideas about the linking between how much food there is, what the conditions are like, how much competition there is between organisms, what that sort of stable food web. So when conditions are favourable, more organisms are going to be able to survive and reproduce, so the population increases because we're going to have more food, we're going to have good weather, we're going to have less chance of dying from disease or we're going to have less chance of being predated upon. Or even if there are predators, there's enough, a large size of the population. So then we get that increase. So that's what's represented here. And obviously we know that these changes could be seasonal and happen within a season because we've got the winter where it's cold and it's grey and there's very few babies being born and there's not much food. And then obviously as spring comes, we get all of the animals being born because there's a surplus of food there. So we get this increase in population. The weather's warmer, they're not going to die of cold, all of that stuff. And then as conditions become less favourable, more organisms are going to start to die and fewer are going to survive to reproduce and so the population size decreases. Again, this happens. And at that point as well, there will be other things that are going to affect it that are going to cause that decrease. And so there's biotic and abiotic factors that can affect the population size throughout a year, but also over longer periods of time. And then obviously we have starvation and that ties in with this idea of competition with your other organisms. So it's about the availability of food 
and competition. So the main thing here is if we get too many individuals, if the population size grows too large, you're ultimately going to not have enough food to support that population and they're going to be competing for food. We get to that peak and then that's going to start causing that decrease. So then the overall number of organisms that are in the population, that is the species sort of group that is supported by that ecosystem that doesn't really change too much is the carrying capacity. So that's the stable amount that it can support on a regular basis. And it normally fluctuates slightly above and slightly below that carrying capacity, as we've seen through the seasons. So you get this kind of a carrying capacity amount and we get fluctuations up and down that tend to stay around that carrying capacity. And if we go too far from the carrying capacity, it decreases, as we've seen for all these reasons. And then again, if it goes too far below that, then conditions will improve because there's less competition and there's less predators because they will have also lost their population size as well. And so then we go back up and it sort of oscillates around this carrying capacity or K. And that's on a seasonal basis. If you look at this long term, you shouldn't get too much fluctuation if your ecosystem is stable. So if you looked at a really, really long term graph, you wouldn't see the tiny, tiny fluctuations. You'd just be able to see long term what was happening and they should stay relatively stable around that carrying capacity unless there is large environmental change and large environmental change is what triggers say mass extinction events or causes an organism to go extinct there are two types of competition intra specific competition is the one we're going to look at first intra meaning between within the same species so if you are competing with an organism that is the same species as you then it's intraspecific competition it occurs when individuals in the same population compete for the same resources it can cause cycle change in the population size around the population's carrying capacity which is where the population grows and shrinks and then grows again so unless there are large changes in the carrying capacity to bring it down and so then that would maybe change the number of the average number of the population, but otherwise it will just go in this kind of pattern. Okay, so now we're looking at interspecific competition. So intraspecific meant within the same species, so organisms of the same species competing with each other. This is when we look at competition between organisms from different species, so inter meaning between two different species. It occurs when different populations compete for the same resources, for example, food. If they're having to share a food resource, there'll be less available food for both of the populations, so the sizes will be limited and they will not be getting enough energy to grow or reproduce, so that will limit their population size. But if one species becomes better adapted to their surroundings, so they're more able to find food or catch food, or they're bigger or they're heavier, for example, they can outcompete the other one, and that population will decline and then could be wiped out from that habitat. This is exactly the example we looked at in a previous video about red and grey squirrels. So the grey squirrels are larger, they're able to get more nutrition out of their food, they're able to put on more weight and therefore survive the winter better, they're a bit more adapted to certain habitats than the red squirrel. So where they used to overlap now, the grey squirrel has outcompeted them and the red squirrel is basically not found at all in those habitats anymore. Predator-prey relationships are slightly different because obviously in this case, one of the organisms is food for the other organism. So predation in this sense just means an organism killing and eating another organism as a source of food. The population sizes of predators and prey in an ecosystem, in a, in a community, in a food chain, are interlinked with each other because as one changes, it causes a change in the other population because obviously they're interdependent. As we've seen, the prey population in future competition in their own species can fluctuate anyway, and then any predation factors has an impact on top of those changes. So examples like the one we're going to look at and the one that's often used is the hare and the lynx, so like a rabbit and then like a cat type creature. They're normally used because they come from a very specific habitat where the food web is very small. So there's not many other food sources for the lynx, for example, and so therefore we, they're literally tied to very closely to each other. In reality, the relationships that we're looking at are a lot more complicated than that because normally one predator doesn't just rely on one prey as a food source and normally there's more than one predator for each species. There's other factors also involved, like we've talked about, like the availability of food for the prey, which could be due to an abiotic factor change. It could be due to competition within their own species. So that fluctuation is going to be happening as well within the hare as a species without the impact of the lynx. And so that can then affect the lynx separately. 
Okay, predator prey diagrams normally look like this. You'll have peaks and troughs of predator and prey. And normally the predator diagrams, there's some rules that they follow. So the predator peaks are always on delay. So after the prey peak, there will be a predator peak. So they're always normally shifted to the right. And there's always going to be more prey than there are predators. So be careful, some graphs in the exam might use two axes. So you could have like hundreds of a predator and then thousands or tens of thousands of a prey. And so because the units might be different, they might put them on different axes. So just be aware and make sure when you are in touch in these graphs, you're really sure which one is prey and which one is predator. So in this case, obviously, our hare is the prey, there's more of them, and our lynx is the predator, there's fewer of them, and their graph is down and shifted to the right. So there is a delay in the effect on the population size of the predator after the changes to the population size of the prey. So we need to be able to explain what's happening here. Again, you may have done this at GCSE and it's very similar. So at one, my lynx population is increasing and it's increasing after the hare population as there's clearly been an increase in the hare population. So there's a lot more of them to eat. They've got more food available, which means they've got more energy. So they're going to be surviving and reproducing more. And so more babies, lynx are being born than are dying. And therefore we get an increase in the population. The hare population starts to fall and it could be due to starvation because they've reached their carrying capacity or they've exceeded their carrying capacity, they've run out of food, the hare population starts to fall down. It also could be as well that predation is getting easier, there's more lynx and so there's more predators around, they're finding it easier because there's more hare and because the hare are weaker, because they're running out of food, they're having to compete with each other, so they're easier to catch. These two things interplay here and we get a decrease in the hare population because more of them are being eaten. Then ultimately we get that delay in sort of response from the lynx, but ultimately the lynx suffers the same effect as the hare. So the hare is the food, so remember they've eaten too much of the hare, the hare has disappeared, we've decreased the number so much that now there's lack of food for the lynx. The lynx is now obviously potentially competing within their own species, within their population. So less food means less survive and reproduce, so the population numbers fall, we've got more lynx dying than are being born. And then this is going to go up and down and up and down and repeat. The time scale is quite long. We're talking decades here. So kind of one cycle every 10 years or plus years or so. It's not something that happens every season. It's going to happen over sort of large periods of time. Okay, so how do we measure population size? Well, we can't count the exact number of every organism in a large area. We can't count and necessarily be able to find, catch and identify every individual of a species in a population in a certain habitat. It just would take too long. And in some places, there's too many to count. You're not going to have to spot them. They could be camouflaged. It's just not possible. So in order to kind of estimate population size, what we do is we sample. So we take a sample from a specific area and we use that to multiply up and estimate the entire population in that area. In order for this to work, your sample must be reliable. So it needs to be a large sample. It needs to be a decent proportion of the real population so that when we're scaling up, we're not taking a tiny, tiny, tiny portion and trying to apply that to a really large area. So the larger the area is, the more small samples need to be taken from that area in order to make sure that our sample is reliable. In order to make sure, again, that the proportion we're taking is representative of the whole population, we need to make sure that the whole of the area that the population is present in could be sampled equally. So it should be randomly and without bias where the samples are chosen. And so every time a sample is chosen, it could have equally have been the chance that we could have sampled any of the area that we're looking at. And so we've got techniques to be able to do that and hopefully remember this from GTSE with like doing the quadrats. So as long as your sample is reliable and representative and you do it in certain ways that allow it to happen, that's all that needs to be important. So the sampling method and the way you're going to sample is going to depend on what organisms you're sampling. Um, plants and anything that moves very, very small, for example, here in my picture, I've got some rocks and on these rocks will most likely be limpets amongst this seaweed. So there will be seaweed here and that's obviously not going to move or go anywhere and potentially inside my area inside my quadrat sample there's going to be limpets. If you're not 100% sure what a limpet is it's kind of like a little shelled organism and it lives on rocks and it clamps down. It clamps down and sucks and attaches itself to the rock and so they very rarely move. 
They will move very, very slowly, and they tend to only move around when they're grazing, which is normally when they're covered in water. So when the tide's down like this, and you can see all of these exposed rocks and this area, there will probably be limpets there, and they're not going to move. So although they're an animal, they're not an animal that moves, or it's an animal that moves very slowly, you can also use a quadrant. If you're going to be looking at animals that can move around and you need to catch them, then you're going to need a different sampling method. But for the first couple of examples we're going to look at, we're going to look at non-motile, non-moving organisms and plants. So we're going to use a quadrat. Again, we'll have seen quadrats before, so it's just a wireframe, typically with an internal grid, and we use it to mark out a small area. There'll be different sizes, and depending on how many squares you've got, there'll be different ways that you can use this. So we're going to have to have a look at how we place the quadrats, which again is similar to GCSE, to sample an area, and then we're going to look at different ways we can measure and count the organisms within that quadrat. Okay, so we have two ways of sampling our non-motile organisms with quadrats. We can do random sampling, so that's where we eliminate personal choice or bias, and we select the sample using random coordinates, and we use a grid sample probably with two tape measures, we make sure that we've got this area that we need sort of gridded up, and so we have some coordinates, and then we select the coordinates at random, because throwing a quadrat is not truly random, because you don't have an equal chance of sampling the whole area. It's based on the direction you're throwing, it's based on how far you can throw, how strong you are, so that is technically biased. So you need to randomly choose coordinates using either a random number generator, dice, or just picking numbers out of a hat, and that makes your sample more reliable because it's not due to personal choice. You've not chosen where to put the quadrat. The more quadrats you can use to the sample to make the sample, the more representative it will be of the whole population. So as we said, the larger the area, the more quadrats you should be doing to get it to be more representative. So I've got my X and Y axis that I've made with some tape measures just laid out on my field. And then I'm picking coordinates out of a hat. So say eight and then 20. I go along eight and then up 20. And that's where I lay my quadrat. And then I've looked at that quadrat. And in that, I have just counted the number of yellow flowers. And that is six because I'm not counting those two bottom ones because they are over the edge of the quadrat. So I could just do that and I could repeat that for every quadrat and then I could calculate the mean number of yellow flowers in total because I could add them all up and divide them by the number of quadrats. But there are other ways I can also count or estimate the abundance of that organism and we'll look at that in a minute because that can be done in either of these methods. So systematic or non-random sampling with transects allows scientists to see how the distribution of a species changes as the habitat changes. So we can't necessarily see that with the random sampling, unless, for example, you are randomly sampling in two different areas. So a field that has been mown and a field that has not been mown, for example, or a field that has lots of shade and a field that doesn't have lots of shade. You could do that and compare your answers. But with this one, what we're doing is we have a changing habitat or a change changing abiotic or biotic factor that goes across a gradient and so we are taking a transect across that area so we know that the environment is changing and we're just going to look at how the distribution of the species changes as we go towards or away from something. So my two examples are either from directly underneath the tree which would be very very shady away from the tree, there's other things you could look at there, obviously there's competition potentially with the tree or we could just simply measure the light intensity. Or you can go right from the edge of a riverbank away, or the sea, for example, away. And then obviously you've got more salt, water, more water, closer you get to the sea than you have further away. So you should see what we call zonation, which is a change in the distribution of species based on the abiotic factors. There's two methods with the transects. Either you've done what I've done in the images, so you have separated them out at regular intervals, so every five metres or every two metres along your tape measure, and that is an interrupted transect where they're placed at regular intervals. Or you have a belt transect where the quadrats are placed directly next to each other. There's benefits to both, obviously the interval or the interrupted one where there's intervals between them is faster because you're covering more kind of length but you're doing fewer quadrats. The belt transect probably gives you more information, you can see more of a change. You have to do, and as you can see in both pictures, you have to repeat the transect. So at the same kind of angle or at the same start point and end point, but to make sure those quadrats don't overlap with each other at any point, so you're not sampling the same area, but you should repeat them, and then you have a repeat for each of your distances. 
So when we're using a quadrat, we can obviously count every individual that's in that quadrat. Sometimes that's harder to do than others. Um, there's still too many. You can't really see or separate individuals, especially if you're looking at something like grass. You can't separate the blades of grass aren't always going to be from separate organisms, for example. Or if you're trying to do it quickly and it would take too long to count all of them, there's sort of different ways that you can use a quadrat to kind of estimate population size. So the first one is percentage frequency. So the probability that a species will be found in a single quadrat. So we work that out by doing the number of quadrats that a species was found in divided by the total number of quadrats times 100. So, for example, 30 quadrats are randomly placed in two different fields. Maybe one's shadier than the other. Maybe one is the grass is cut in one and it's not in the other. Maybe they've got two different sort of crops growing in the fields. And in one field, daisies were found in 18 out of the 30 quadrats. So it's just whether they're present or absent. That's all it is. Is it, it did you have at least one individual in that quadrat? And in the other field, daisies were only found in six out of the 30 quadrats. So then we can obviously do the number of quadrats the species was found in, divided by the total number, which was 30 for each one, and then that gives us a percentage. So 18 out of 30 times 100 gives us 60%. The percentage covering field 2, 6 out of 30 times 100 gives us 20%. So the other way we can estimate sort of how much space a species is taking up in a certain area is using percentage cover. So percentage cover is faster, but it's more subjective because you are not actually really counting or measuring. You're using a visual estimate of an area of a quadrat that's covered by a species. So it tends to be overestimated for flowering plants where they think about they've got sort of broader flowers and leaves covering a certain area and then also underestimated for plants that grow very close to the ground and ones that you can't see so easily so it's often easy to do this if you use quite a large quadrat a quadrat that will be 10 by 10 squares because then you've got 100 squares and then that means that you can just see how many squares are covered in total in area by the species, how many sort of rough squares you can find that species in, and then out of 100 that will give us a, a nice easy percentage. So here's an example, I've got three different species of plant, they're all different, got different coloured flowers, and then I also have grass as well in my quadrat. And so that's obviously the grass is just the green, so how much is just containing the grass, and then you've got red, pink and white flowers of the different species. So I've roughly counted sort of if it's a whole square, it is obviously covered, it definitely counts. And then I've had to use my kind of subjective judgment as to whether something's covering the majority of a square or not, and sort of a rough estimate of how it is. And obviously this makes up roughly just under 100%, so it's not perfect. And obviously, technically there's grass in every square, it's just about where the grass is the majority and where it's the minority. So percentage coverage, you can see, is a way of doing it quite quickly and getting kind of a general idea of how much area a species is covering, but it's not going to be as accurate as actually counting them individually or even doing percentage frequency. Okay, so let's look at how we sample motile organisms. So in order to catch organisms that are moving, you can need the right equipment and it depends on what you're catching and where you're catching depends on what equipment you will need to use. And in order to, when we're catching them, obviously we're just catching them to identify them and count them. So we're not catching them for a really long time and we should be just obviously identifying what species we've got and, and counting them and then they can be going on their way. So the best method is going to depend on where you're doing it and what you're catching. So the equipment that we might need to mention here is something potentially like a pewter, which is something that can connect small insects. You suck into a little mouthpiece and it creates a little vacuum and there's a little suction tube that then can suck insects into the canister. It's perfectly safe in there. There's a little filter to stop you sucking up any insects and then you can observe them in the little canister and then you can remove that and then tip them back out. Pitfall traps for larger animals, um, literally when you dig a little hole, you cover it all up so they can't see it and they will fall in. Obviously they can't fall too far, but it should be deep enough that they, they can't get out straight away and then you would have to check them, count them, identify them and you could help them back out. Sometimes you might need to put food or some kind of bait in there in order to get them to come towards the trap. Sweep nets, so really big long nets can be used for catching insects like things like butterflies and things in the air, sweeping it along tall grass which would disturb the grass and then things would fly out of the grass and trap them in the net. Large nets as well for aquatic organisms so you wouldn't need as much dense fine mesh necessarily but you'd need to be able to let water move through it and then you could use that to sweep areas of a, a moving river or lake for example. 
So once you've picked your equipment, you have to think about how you're going to sample. And there are some ethical considerations with this. Some people think that capturing organisms is unethical completely because it causes the animal an organism stress and so it shouldn't be done but if that is the only way that you're going to be able to sample a certain area then you should be making sure that your handling with it should be kept to a minimum like i said you really don't need to keep them for a very long time you don't need to hold them or handle them for long and all organisms should be treated carefully and with respect the main reason as well for the stress is obviously because that's not nice for, to put an animal through that. But if they get really stressed or if they get really affected by being captured, it could reduce their chances of survival after you release them. So it's not just only the impact you have while you have them, but also how that could impact their life once you let them go. OK, so the method we're going to use to take a sample of moving organisms and use that to estimate population size is the mark release recapture method. So we take a small sample of the population using whichever appropriate equipment and method we've decided on, depending on what organisms they are and the habitat they live in. And we should take the sample and then count them. You'd probably take more than one sample, you'd take it in different areas, do repeats, etc. But you do that. When you count them, after you've counted them, you'll have to handle them to do this, but you'll mark them in some way. A spot of paint, an identification tag, something that's harmless, and there should be some considerations about what you're marking, where you're marking, what you're using to mark with, and then you let them go. So then you release them back, and then you need to wait long enough for those individuals that you caught in the first sample to have mixed randomly back in with the population, because the point is that we're going to look at, when we resample, the proportion of the marked individuals to the unmarked individuals, and that should give us an idea of the proportion that our sample is to the giant population. So you need to leave at least at least 24 hours, if not longer, for them to mix back in. And then you'll take a second sample in exactly the same way. So that's important there because it needs to be the same time, same place, ideally, the same type of sample. So the same equipment used, same time of year, same time of day, same place. Everything should be the same. And then you're going to record the total number of animals that you get in the second sample and the number of marked animals that were in the second sample that you got. And so then now you estimate the population size using this formula. So we take the number that we caught in the first sample, we times it by the number caught in the second sample, and then we divide that number by the number of marked individuals that we've had in our second sample. And that will give us an estimate of how many of that individual there are in the total population in that area. Now, obviously, if you've done repeats, you could do the mean number caught in sample one, the mean number caught in sample two, and the mean number of marked in sample two, or you can just do the total of all of your repeats as well. So there are some problems with using this technique to estimate population size because it relies on some assumptions, which are obviously some of realistic assumptions or assumptions that we can be confident that can happen and some that can't. So it relies on the idea that your population is closed. So in your habitat that you've sampled, your population, the population itself, the number of total number of organisms of the population stays the same. That would mean no migration out or into the population, so no organisms leave, no organisms come in, and that there's no births or deaths that occur. And this just has to be in the time between the first time you take your sample and the second time you take your sample. This is something that obviously can't be controlled. The sooner your sample is taken from between first and second, the less time there is, then you can kind of be a bit more confident that this is less likely to have happened, but you can't control it at all. And also there's things like actual deaths, so the chance of organisms actually dying. Then there's also things to think about like, oh, what if that organism got trapped somewhere? Or what if that organism has flown away? Or what if that organism can't be captured for other reasons because it's a caterpillar that's now gone into a cocoon, so it's not moving anymore, so therefore it can't be captured. There's sort of other things that can limit how the chances of you getting the same number of organisms to sample each time. It also assumes, similar to what we've just been saying, that all members of the population mix randomly. So when you put them back, they're completely randomly mixed up. They haven't stayed in the area near to where the trap is. They've sort of gone back into the population and mixed. And so that each member of the population has an equal chance of being captured every time. So when you won't go into your sample, obviously you've collected a certain number of organisms. You put them back. You need them to go and completely mix randomly so that when you go and do your second sample, you're not just resampling the same ones that you've already done. Again, it relies on the fact that all the animals will behave exactly the same. 
that they will disperse, that you've left enough time for them to disperse. And it also relies on certain animals behaving in a certain way. So for example, males and females are often going to behave differently, especially if it's around springtime and the females are caring for young. So they're not going to go exploring, they're not going to leave nests, they're not going to leave their children, or they might not be able to move as far because if they've got offspring, they're not going to be able to take risks. They won't be demonstrating risky behaviour, so they're not going to sort of go into somewhere they're unfamiliar with. So they're less likely to be caught. So in reality, if you're only really sampling males at a certain time, you're not sampling all of the population or you're not able to equally chance of sampling all the population. Again, this is something you can't necessarily control. That you assume that the marks that you've put on or the tags that you've put on have not been rubbed off or lost or removed between captures so that you definitely know that if you marked them before, they will still be marked when you go back. This is something easier and something maybe that you can try and control a bit more. But you shouldn't try, in order to do this, use anything that is really sort of sticky or really toxic or anything that could be sort of super waterproof and therefore is a, is a danger to the animals. And really think about what you're using in order to tag them ethically, as well as trying to make sure it doesn't rub off. Also, you're assuming that your mark or tag will not harm the animal or affect its survival in any other way. It shouldn't slow it down, its movement, it shouldn't affect its movement, it shouldn't likely change its behaviour, it shouldn't make it be, I don't know, shunned by the other organisms and like left out and then not shared food or whatever or get, not given access to certain places. It shouldn't make them more likely to be predated. So for example, if you put bright paint on a prey species that is normally going to be camouflage, you've sort of ruined that in some way. And so then predators are more likely to be able to see it and therefore they're more likely to catch it and eat it, which means you've increased the chances of your marked organisms being killed, uh, predated upon before you do your second sampling and so therefore then you've got an unfair test there because your marked ones were more likely to die so there's going to be fewer of them in the population when you sample the second time. So it's one of those things again you can try and do the best you can to control this but you're not always going to be able to account for animals behaviour. Okay, so let's go through this then. So primary succession is our first example. It happens on land that is newly formed or exposed where there is no soil. So often this is from something like a glacier retreat. So when the ice melts or a glacier is moving slowly over time, because they do move and sort of slide, what they leave behind is what's often called a scree slope. So it's bare exposed rock that hasn't been exposed because it's been trapped under the ice. And then obviously once the ice retreats and it is then exposed to all of the different elements and then also obviously plant species can start to colonise it. So seeds and spores blow on the wind and they're going to land on this bare rock surface and they're going to begin to colonise it. The conditions are very hostile, so it's going to potentially be very exposed. There's going to be high light intensity. There's going to be little water because it's like dry, bare rock and there's nowhere for the water to sit and be whole and like contained. So it could be, when we say exposed, it can be very windy, for example. So you've got all of these kind of harsh, hostile abiotic conditions that mean only certain species could actually grow here. So even if some other seeds were blown over at the time, only some species like lichens, for example, would actually be able to colonise and start to grow on this bare rock face. Then we get our pioneer species proper. So lichens are a pioneer species, they're one example. And then we're going to get some of our other lichens as well, but also some small plants annual plants so that means they live for a year they don't come back each year they just kind of live for one season grow and then die so that means their life cycle is quite short and so they're going to die and they'll be decomposed by microorganisms through the process of decay that we know because microorganisms would be able to survive here especially if they have material to break down which is what they're going to have when these plants die and so that starts to create a layer of soil on top of the bare rock so the breakdown means it's going to release some nutrients and we get what is called a hummus, um, which is basically the soil that's on top of the rock. But it's a very thin layer at the moment. The new organisms are then able to come in. So the pioneer species have started to create this even better, kind of thicker layer of soil. And so what they're able to do is they've made the conditions less hostile, less harsh, because there's more soil, which means there's nutrients. Also, there's soil for roots to grow into, which plants need to be stable. There's going to be water that's going to be able to be trapped in between those soil particles. So that means that they've got access to more water 
and therefore more of them can grow. So we get this more of them growing and therefore more of them dying. And if more of them die and decay, then we get an even deeper layer of soil with even more nutrients in it. So we're making the conditions even better for other plants to come along and colonize. So now we get to a point where there's enough soil that we can actually have some shrubs and some small trees appear. And they are sometimes shade intolerant, so they're used to having a lot of light because there's still be a lot of light if they're quite small and they're all on the same kind of height level. They will become what we call the dominant species. So the dominant species is always the species that's having the most change and the most effect on the environment. But biodiversity has increased. So we're increasing our biodiversity as we go along because we're increasing the amount of different plant species that can live there. And remember, that's also having an effect on the number of different animal species that can live there as well. And then lastly, we get to our climax community. So the climax community is the greatest and most biodiverse community that this habitat can now support. So we will have a mixture of species, but mostly we're talking about large trees and then some small shrubs that can cope living underneath them in the shade that they're creating. And we've got this kind of, normally we've got oak, for example, oak forest, ash forest that we're going to have in the UK is what our normal climax community would look like. So if all land was just left to go through this process of succession, we'd have forest of some kind covering most of the UK and that's what it would have looked like sort of back in the early times before humans had really colonised a lot of the land and sort of started to chop down trees and things like that. So then trees and big trees become the dominant species because they are now the ones that have the most effect on the environment but it stops there so it doesn't change anymore it becomes a stable community a stable environment so we don't get much change it would be like that for hundreds and hundreds of years after that point. It has taken hundreds of years to get to this point. This does not happen overnight. This takes a very long time to occur. And then when we get to that climax community, then that would be very stable and it wouldn't change. So we talked about which species become the dominant species as we move through that process of succession. And it's because they're changing the abiotic conditions the most. And the main thing is they're making it more suitable or less hostile. The next species to grow. So we need to have a think about some examples. Don't necessarily need to know all these examples off the top of your head, although realistically for pioneer species, really we should know lichens. And but it's also thinking about how are they actually changing, how are they improving the abiotic conditions, how are they making it less hostile and more suitable for the next species. That's the point you would have to get into your long answer if you were talking about succession. So it would be going through the stages, talking about pioneer species, maybe give an example, explain how it makes it more possible for the next species then say what the next species would be say about the increasing in the soil and then moving on to oh what would the next species potentially be and how would that make it better for the next species after okay now how come trees can come and that's the kind of answer you would need to give so here's some kind of walk through of each stage and sort of talk about how they actually change that abiotic conditions so the pioneer species, we said lichens, the reason lichens are good at being a pioneer species is because they secrete acids. So they erode the rocks, the bare rock face, and start to release some of those minerals and also break up the surface of that rock, which increases little cracks and crevices that the seeds are then going to potentially come and be able to sit in. Mosses also is sort of the next stage of pioneer species. They have very, very small roots and they're very good at re retaining moisture so that they are able to grow in very, very little amounts of soil. Then we have marrow grass. So this is a specific example of sand dunes. So sand dunes are an example of where succession can happen because obviously bare sand is the same as bare rock. There are no plant species there. So marrow grass is normally one of the first pioneer species to colonise sand dunes. And they can do that because they have very long roots that reach right down. Means they can get some water, but they can also get through the sand, hold on in, in the slidey kind of sand environment they've got. How do these pioneer species change? Well, as we said, they release minerals from the rocks. They create soil. So most of the main thing to say is that they decompose when they die and they form this first layer of very thin basic soil, which starts tracking water and so therefore increases water availability and increases some nutrients for the next species. So the next kind of intermediate stage, what could we have? Well, we can have grasses, we can have ferns, we can have small flowering plants. Then we've got things like sand sedge, which is the next stage in a sand dune example. How are they going to change the abiotic conditions? Well, they create a deeper 
richer soil when they die, adding more, even more nutrients and therefore trapping um, also even more water and moisture. They also, some of these species can then start associating with nitrogen fixing bacteria or mycorrhizal fungi as well. And that increases the concentration of available nitrates and phosphates if we're talking about mycorrhizal fungi. These are mostly talking about how we're making conditions favourable for the next set of species. Because obviously most plants that will associate with nitrogen fixing bacteria are able to survive in low nitrogen soil conditions. So then, as we were saying before, if then the soil becomes quite rich in nitrogen, they're not going to be as adapted when other species come. Once the nitrogen is there, they will outcompete them. It can also do the opposite, and sand sedge, for example, can actually make the conditions more hostile for the species before. So the barren grass will die out or not be able to be as successful and the sand sedge is therefore outcompeting it because it actually stabilises the soil and stabilises the sand and barren grass needs the sand to shift and move in order to grow effectively. So there's kind of two competing sort of ideas here. One is that obviously these plants are making the conditions better and so more plants are going to be able to come and grow here but they're also potentially outcompeting with the plants before or preventing them from staying and so we see this disappearing as the marron grass on the sand dunes with sand sedges present because those conditions are no longer how the marron grass likes to be able to grow. And then lastly we have the climax community so normally like I said these are bigger organisms, big trees, big shrubs, in the UK things like oak, birch, ash are kind of our normal trees for a climax community. In a deciduous forest, in a coniferous forest the tree species would be different if we were in a colder climate. So this is the other thing you have to think about is that obviously the climax community is going to look very different depending on what the actual climate is like in all of your different examples. So like I said, if we had like a more northern Scottish Highland kind of snowy cold general temperature, then that climax community is going to be more coniferous forest. So kind of trees with pine trees and needles and spruce and all of that rather than big broadleaf trees like oak and birch which will be more used to be seen in sort of like the southern England. Same as if you're looking at a climax community in Antarctica or if you're looking at a climax community in the desert like on the sand dunes they're not going to get giant oak trees on the sand dunes their climax community will be small shrubs of some kind okay so that's something to think about when you're if you're given any example with any, any data or a description or pictures or something about in the exam you need to kind of adapt this succession story to what they've given you in terms of the species that are present. How do they change the antibiotic conditions? Well this is sort of moving from the late intermediate stage into the climax community they're going to do things like create shade which can stabilize temperature because it means that it'll be cooler for some of the plants underneath. They can also decrease light intensity but that makes it a prime environment for things like shade tolerant plants. They can trap air underneath canopy layers and that increases humidity, which obviously is good for some plants because they like a humid environment. They can reduce the wind exposure, so if you're less exposed, you're less likely to blow over. All of it also increasing biodiversity because they act as shelter and food sources. There are some organisms, animals that only live in trees or up in trees, they wouldn't move around on the ground. So you need a big canopy of trees that they can jump from tree to tree without going on the floor. And then also increases the leaf litter. So the more trees and shrubs you have, falling leaves, especially if they're losing them in sort of autumn and stuff like that, they're going to then collect on the ground, which creates leaf litter, which some organisms live in. Also, some organisms feed off of. So think about all the fungus and the microorganisms that feed off of all of this detritus. It also increases the depth and the nutrient content in soil, and again, increases the water content and things like that. So that's how we get from sort of just no soil and how are these abiotic conditions being changed every single time with these new communities that are coming up? How is it improving it for the next one, allowing those new species to colonise? So secondary succession is the other example of succession you need to know. And it happens where plants are removed, but the soil remains kind of intact. So really just above ground, all of those plants and everything else is removed. And so we go back to bare soil, but it's not bare rock. So the examples are like a forest fire or deforestation, where they can come down and chop down a whole forest and clear the land. But there is still soil there. There's soil, there's nutrients, there's kind of water retention. So the conditions aren't as hostile to start with as they were for primary succession, where there is bare rock and there's no soil or anything. So it can occur at any stage after the pioneer species stage of primary succession. 
And it happens in the same way. So the same stages, the same steps, you're just starting at a later stage. So instead of starting with bare rock and lichens and mosses, we're starting with the kind of small grasses, flowering plants, etc. So sometimes humans do not want full succession to occur. And so sometimes secondary succession can be forced by human action in order to try and regenerate land or to try and prevent a climax community from forming. Most of the time it's because we're trying to conserve a pioneer species or a species in the intermediate range and we don't want the climax community to form because that would outcompete that species and, and it would be lost. So most of the time this is a conservation method and we're going to look at conservation next, but this is one of the ways that conservation can be maintained. So example of methods that are used to prevent it, some of these are conservation and some of these are just through human action. So controlled burning, which happens on the heathers, heather moors in Scotland, for example, where you, you don't set fire to a whole uh, load of land and let it run riot and run sort of wild because that would be dangerous, obviously. But you can burn and control where you burn and sort of put the fire out and make, make sure that it doesn't run away. So there's sort of end points and barriers to make sure it stops at a certain point. Grazing herbivores, so letting animals graze deliberately. Sometimes we do the succession controlling in order to continue there to be land for herbivores to graze or to feed but sometimes it's that just the act of grazing animals eating the grass keeping the seeds and the plants down so they get eaten if they get too tall that can actually maintain a sort of meadow-like structure mowing does the same things so cutting the grass actually mowing down the grass and keeping it at a certain height also prevents succession from happening and then coppicing trees so preventing those kind of early tree species from getting too large and growing into major trees and then creating lots of shade what we do is we chop them at a certain age so at a certain height down to a stump and then they regrow back from that stump, but they regrow in quite a fine way. So the twigs and branches are sort of finer and they grow kind of slower. And so then it doesn't always create this really big, dense canopy that makes a lot of shade and that can change, stop those avartic conditions from changing that way and then prevent succession from carrying on. So conservation is protection and management of a species and habitats in order to maintain biodiversity. Remember, biodiversity is just the variety or the number of different species present in a habitat. So biodiversity is decreasing. We've got a little infographic there. So biodiversity loss is being caused by so many things, all being caused by humans, including climate change, habitat loss, overexploitation like overfishing, habitat loss like deforestation, pollution, our effect on climate change and invasive species. And this is becoming more and more and more common and happening in more and more places around the globe because the population is growing exponentially. And because there's more people, they need more space to live, to build homes. They need more space to grow food because we need more food because there's more people to feed. And so the impact of just us taking up land and us but the way we're using the land and using the natural resources and the farming and agricultural practices that are increasing to try and increase the food demand, all of that is having an impact on biodiversity. It's unsustainable the way we're using resources and the way agriculture is currently being done, and that's having an impact on the biodiversity of all species in like all habitats. People, especially in places where they are very reliant on the land and very reliant on the natural resources or reliant on farming are often quite reluctant to embrace conservation efforts to try and prevent the impact of their current practices on the species around them, the wild environments around them, because it can directly affect their livelihood, their income, and also obviously can reduce their access to some of those natural resources, which they are reliant on for food and shelter and fuel and money income as well. So conservation efforts are always constantly trying to find a balance between maintaining the sustainability of the natural resources, maintaining protecting areas to allow species to live in the wild peacefully and to reduce biodiversity loss, but still allowing countries that need to develop and people, their places that need to expand and need more homes and more land to that to happen as well. So thinking about sustainability practices like management of forests, fisheries and farmlands, and then conservation practices like wildlife parks, preventing overfishing, preventing hunting, preventing poaching, and just generally kind of monitoring species and preventing them from being damaged by human impact.
So as we said, there are conflicts and it's becoming more and more necessary to find careful management processes to try and get a balance between the conflicting pressures that are affecting actual efforts to try and conserve biodiversity in various places. And we need to kind of be aware of these conflicts so that we can kind of talk about the debate between these and argue both sides. So obviously... The main side always is trying to make sure that species are protected, that biodiversity is not being lost. But we have to balance that with the costs that it might take in order to try and pay subsidies or to try and encourage people to follow these rules. And also it's quite tricky to sometimes having to employ people to enforce the rules as well. It can obviously affect local economies. So we've said that it can affect people's livelihood, people's income, if practices that are now sort of limited are the ways they get their income, or they have to take up other alternative jobs or practices that are part of the conservation effort rather than what they were doing before, and they could have made more money previously. Trying to allow the development of society to continue whilst trying to reduce the impact on species. So that's trying to still conserve species and conserve their way of life but still allow people to build homes and spread out and take up space so thinking about ways of limiting that and not stopping people from developing where they need to balancing the conserving of species with the need to protect food security for a growing population there is no doubt that obviously with more people comes a greater food demand we need to feed everybody i mean to make sure there's a supply of food everywhere and that everyone's getting enough in order to survive but in order to do that we can't overfish or overwork the land in order to a point where to try and increase yields but at the expense of other species that is obviously not acceptable. So there's this constant toing and froing between maybe local populations or farmers and the people who are trying to conserve the species. And you may get questions where they present case studies or data where they might sort of ask you to see both sides or evaluate what's happening or just to kind of discuss the issues that can happen around conservation and why some people might not be as open to it as others. Okay, so how does agriculture impact on biodiversity? It reduces biodiversity because they're growing monocultures, which is obviously just one species, often even one variety of one species. So a very narrow range of allele frequencies in that population. And that obviously a large area of that just one species has a really low biodiversity. And if you're using a really large area to support just that one species, if most of that area is taken up by crop biomass, then there's little area and resources left for anything else to grow nearby anyway. And they obviously use herbicides and pesticides to prevent other plants from growing, weed species growing nearby, and also insect species or anything that they think will be a pest that could spread disease or damage the crop in some way. So killing those organisms that the farmer doesn't want reduces biodiversity even further. There's fewer food sources. So if there's just this one species for a really large area, that's it. There's and they're killing everything that feeds on it. Then there's not going to be plenty of habitats or food sources to support other organisms. Also the removal of hedgerows. So you can see my two fields here. This sort of on the left was what it used to look like or would be the ideal, would be all fields would be bordered with a hedge. And so there would be this kind of separation between the fields and make them smaller potentially and have these different species and plant species forming hedgerows in between. So although we do have large areas of one species, there's a mixture in between to help kind of increase those habitats and food sources. But obviously farmers have removed them and farmlands getting larger and larger, larger with sort of fewer and fewer hedges between them and just ditches instead or tracks with no plant life on them. So as we said, hedgerows have this narrow belt of small plants, shrubs, maybe some small trees, and they normally tend to surround fields and then go along roads. They used to be marking the boundaries between the land of the different owners of the different fields and also to prevent animals from moving from one field to another when you didn't want your cows escaping. If you put a decent hedge around it, they couldn't, they couldn't escape. But there's loads of other benefits to hedgerows as well. They help prevent soil erosion from flooding. If you think about obviously potentially spraying nutrients and other things onto the fields and liquid, but also if there's really heavy rain, soil can get washed away and get washed into rivers and things. But having the hedgerows there with all their roots really helps prevent that soil erosion from occurring. They provide food sources and nesting sites for birds. They support a diverse and plant animal species range because they provide lots of different niches. There'll be lots of different food sources in them. There'll be lots of different habitats in them underneath the hedge, in the hedge bushes sort of perched on the top, maybe in a small tree. They can also attract insects away from crops. So they could technically, insects could be attracted to maybe some of the flowers, some of the nectar, some of the plants on the hedgerows. But equally, they can also be home to other insects, but these could be useful because they could be predators of the pest species that would normally kill or damage the crops in some way. For example, aphids, 
aphids can spread diseases and damage crops. Ladybirds are predators of aphids. So if you've got species that support ladybirds in your hedgerows, then they are likely to go off and eat the aphids that might be eating your crop plants. They also act as wildlife or migration corridors. So being able to move between fields or across this landscape by going in the hedges and in the trees around the edges of all the fields is much safer than trying to run across the field if you're a rabbit or a hedgehog or a field mouse because then you're more likely to be exposed, more likely to be caught by a predator. Also, there's herbicides and pesticides and chemicals there that you don't want to go near if you're certain species. So being able to run around the safety of the edges if they're covered up and enclosed with these hedges, then that's much safer for you. So that increases biodiversity, increases their safety. Why might farmers want to get rid of the hedgerows then? So what's their argument, counter argument? It's because they act as a refuge from pesticides and herbicides. So weeds grow there and obviously they can seed, go to flower, spread their seed. Their seed can blow in the wind back into the field. And also pests and insects can live there. And if they're not spraying the hedges because they're not supposed to, then they won't be killed by the pesticides. So they can then go back out into the field and start eating them again. They also reduce the crop yield slightly because obviously the hedges and all the roots of the, all the plants around the edges will be going down and underneath the soil and they can also use up some water and nutrients including some of the fertilizers that they put on the fields and so if that's going to the hedges it's not going to the crops and that all could reduce the growth of the crops because they're having to share and compete with the hedge species for nutrients and then we've got smaller field sizes. So by having that edge to your land, you then have to start planting further in away from the hedge. It means that there's slightly less area that you can plant your crop in. And also you need space to be able to move machinery around the edge of the field. And if the hedges are there, then you can get your machinery caught in those hedges. So you need to move your machinery in. So you just end up having less yield because you're unable to plant in an as wide an area whereas if you just didn't have the hedge and it went all the way up to the edge of the road then you'd have plenty of space for your tractor or whatever to move around so these are the arguments against it for farmers they are as i said doing schemes where they're trying to promote farmers from still keeping these hedgerows and keeping these wild borders on their land and actually paying them to try and support them to do that ouch This is why in some videos I explain scratches.